So good morning and welcome back. I hope you all had a fun or a restful evening last night getting to uh, maybe have further conversation with folks that you met here yesterday or with others that you came uh, to this orientation with. Um, yesterday I know we, we gave a lot of information out. Um, I won't say we threw a lot at you, but we discussed a lot with you. Um, Hopefully, you know, we set up the morning. You had a chance to hear from our uh, office director, Shelly Paticha, who was able to kind of um, remind us of the larger context and really some of the work that we're doing in the administration through the partnership, and that your grants are really kind of the proof in the pudding of uh, the administration's work and our belief in the importance of local solutions to really put together all of these different pieces and come up with plans and with projects uh, that I think are going to lead the path towards a more economically sustainable future for the country. So uh, she laid that out. Then you had an opportunity to hear from some of our partners at DOT, EPA, and USDA. And then really, uh, they say the devil is in the details. And there was a lot of discussion of those details yesterday afternoon. Today, I guess if we have a theme, it really would be around, we want you to succeed. Uh, there is a lot of details uh, when you get a federal grant, a lot of rules, a lot of requirements. We know that a lot of pressure is on you as well. Folks uh, like us who want you to succeed and are going to want to hear those stories and, and keep the pressure on to, to get the work done, to bring people together, to really embrace new strategies and new ways of doing this. But there's going to also be a lot of pressure, um, some of you have already experienced this, from folks who don't want you to succeed and who are really going to be questioning what you're doing, trying to find ways perhaps to be disruptive of what you're doing. And that is, that's really a challenge. You're going to hear from um, some of the year one grantees today who've, who've been in that heat, in that fire, uh, for much of the last year. And I think we know, we know that can be a challenge. We also know it can be a challenge because you may have people in your community who feel so strongly about this that no matter what you do, it won't be good enough for them. Uh, and so that's really a pressure on both sides of that. And I think we are very committed to helping you succeed. And so we want to hear, how can we do that? How can we best support the work that you're doing? Uh, you heard Dwayne and Solon mention yesterday, um, while there are a lot of rules or requirements, um, I guess I would say one of the, the positives is that this is a new program. So we also have the opportunity to be a little bit flexible, to see if there are things that we're telling you to do and they don't make sense. Can we revisit those? Can we tweak those? Can we provide more guidance to you that could be helpful in that process? Naomi talked about the regional staff. They very much want to help you succeed. They want to be part of that partnership. They also are the most attuned to what resources exist to help you think about that implementation. And I know some of you are asking, how do we connect up with someone in community planning and development who's in charge of the community development block grant program or other programs? Again, I would encourage you to start with that local contact in your state or in the regional office, and they can really best connect you up to who you may want to be coordinating with, both within HUD, but also who are those contacts in the city, in the state, that also have a decision-making role with some of those resources. Uh, you'll be meeting later today the capacity building teams that we were able to uh, select and just recently got off the ground. This is another thing um, you guys will have a leg up over the year one grantees. They spent most of last year waiting for the capacity building teams to come together. Uh, those teams now exist and they're just, you've probably been getting the emails from Duane. They are getting rolling and getting off the ground. You're not required to go to every single one of those webinars. I saw the email this week that had like 12 different things coming up and I thought, wow, I could do nothing but listen to capacity building webinars. That's not the point. The point is to really look at which ones make sense for you. Uh, as a deputy director, I love to delegate in my office, so perhaps you could also delegate in your teams if there's something that you think, hey, you know, this would actually be a good webinar for one of our partners or one of my staff who's really been kind of struggling with this issue to hear about and think about. So the capacity builder's definitely there to provide support. Uh, you're going to be meeting later on one-on-one -on -one with your GTRs. Uh, again, 
You know, they are there and your grant officers are there to support you. And finally, you won't interact probably a lot with me or with Shelly, but we are here to support you too. I left some of my cards out on the table. Uh, if you ever can't get in touch with your grant technical representative, if there's a particularly thorny political issue or a great story you want to be sure to tell or something exciting that's happening, uh, or you're having a problem with your GTR, feel free to call me, email me. The same goes with our director. And the secretary himself really wants you to succeed. Um, he didn't really plan this, but it turns out if you're able to stick around for a little while, he's going to be doing a town hall meeting just out by the coffee shop at 3.30 today. And if any of you are around and want to stick around, you can meet him. You can tell him who you are and what you're doing, and he'll probably get really excited because he really loves this program. He loves this program so much that, as you heard yesterday, he fought to make sure that this program is part of our fiscal year 13 budget proposal. I've been spending a lot of time with our director uh, beginning those conversations with people on the Hill to talk about why we want this program to be restored and why we think this program is so critical that for a small federal investment that's being leveraged with your non-federal and private sector resources, we're really making a down payment on the future of this country. You all are going to be developing plans for a corridor, for your city, for the region that hopefully are going to be creating a plan for prosperity for where you live, that are going to be looking at really what are going to be the priorities for how you're going to be investing scarce public resources and hopefully attracting private investment as well. Uh, I think we all know the days of you know, overflowing state budgets or federal budgets or local budgets, those days are probably gone, gone for good. So we need to be smarter. We need to think how we can achieve multiple benefits with one investment. We need to think about which of these investments can we really entice the private sector to partnering with us? What does that mean? What are some things that the private sector can do well? But what are some things we have to have the public sector involved with? Because it won't happen otherwise. We think affordable housing, uh, preservation and creation is one of those things. We also know that there are other things. So again, it's, it's really thinking about how uh, all of these pieces come together. And towards that aim, uh, I guess I just also really wanted to make a passion plea before we get into the day. We need your help. We want to tell your story. We need to tell your story. But we can only tell your story if you, A, have a story to tell, and B, if you're sharing that information, we're keenly interested in your successes, big and small, as you move forward over the next several years. Uh, when we go and we talk to folks on the Hill, they, they frequently, they don't even know that a grant has been given in their community. And then when they do hear about it, they're like, well, this sounds very interesting. How can we get involved? And so again, we encourage you, as you're starting to think about kickoff meetings and other meetings that are going to be happening in your district, Invite you know, the senator's staff or the congressman's staff uh, as, as you're thinking about who all to, to be there. And we want these to be big, inclusive processes. Uh, but it's helpful for them to know that. Um, another question we get asked a lot is, well, this sounds like really good stuff. But why should the federal government be involved? Why should we care? Why should we be investing in any of this? And you know, we, we can say what we think. But it's actually more helpful, you know, as you're doing your work, does it help? Does it make a difference? Does it matter to have a federal partner in all of this? We assume it does, or you wouldn't have asked us for money. Um, but really, again, this, there's going to be a tremendous need to tell the story. You're going to have that need in your communities to tell your story. What is the value of this? It's going to be different in every place, because you all have different needs. You have different issues you're trying to address and tackle. Um, what we're working on, you had in your binder, I don't know if you did talk about this yesterday, but there's a little two-pager in there. I'm not even sure where it's at in the binder. But this is just to give you a sample of kind of our latest effort of telling the story about these programs. Uh, you'll see we kind of try to include the overall big picture, the demand, the interest, the statistics on the grants but also peppering it with some of the local examples. You know, we're starting to see from the year one grantees things that are being accomplished in Memphis, in, yes, Columbia, uh, Tennessee, that you all and everyone else in the country received an email about yesterday. Don't worry about that email. Um, 
But, uh, you know, we really wanted to kind of capture these stories and tell them. And so I just wanted to, to really end by um, articulating that we are in this together. Uh, we want you to succeed. We want to succeed. We want to, you know, hopefully uh, have a program next year so that we can add additional communities to your work and what you're doing. And also, um, part of that success is the learning network. And again, you'll hear a little bit about this, but through the capacity building providers, I think the best resource we may be able to provide is linking you up so you can all learn and talk with each other what's working and what's not working, uh, both from those we funded last year and from uh, hopefully your new friends that are in this room here today as well. So um, with that, I will turn it over to the next section, unless folks have any questions for me. I'm happy to address or answer anything that you all might have on your minds. No? We're good to go? Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the great work that I know you are all going to be doing. Uh, and again, please, you know, feel free to keep us in touch and keep me informed and keep Dwayne busy. Mission accomplished. Oh. Good morning, everyone. So, as Maria mentioned, uh, it was a bit like the Matrix yesterday. We sat you down in the chair and bolted your feet in and just put the plug right in the back, and you just took information for 10 hours. So, have a seat. We're going to start again. No, actually, we're, I think, going to move a little bit from the science uh, of the grant making to some of the art and craft today. And to start that off, we're actually going to have some reflections from a distinguished group which includes both GTR and grantees. So I'd invite the star grantee uh, guest to come on up to the stage. For a moment, they were contemplating whether they were gonna come up or not, and come on up. This is Summer Frederick, entering stage first. She's with Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission. Amy Cotter, who's with Metropolitan Area Planning Commission uh, Council, and uh, then I want to ask uh, a smattering of GTR to come up. We'll probably swap in and out, but I'm going to start with, uh, with Solon and Steve, and uh, maybe we'll have Tad initially. The three of you guys can come up and join them. That would be great. Don't worry, I'll get your chance. So the context here is uh, how to really build an effective um, grant program, uh, planning process, et cetera. And what I thought we might do, we might need another chair. One second. Is uh, give Amy and Summer a couple minutes each just to introduce themselves and you know, say a little bit about their agency and, and grant snapshot, just so there's some context. And uh, just they can mention which type of grant they are uh, and then we're going to go through a few of the elements that we think are really helpful uh, in terms of making this work. And we'll engage both the GTR in terms of what they're looking for and what, what they've found useful and helpful, and also uh, ask the grantees their reflections. And I told them they should be candid if they want to say, you know, the GTR really got on our nerves with this one. <laughs> they're welcome to say that, of course. Their GTRs are here, but that's okay. So, uh, Amy, you can start if you like. Uh, hi, my name is Amy Cotter. I am the Director of Regional Plan Implementation at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council in Metropolitan Boston. I know there's some folks from Boston here. Um, we, we finished our regional plan in December 2008 and we're underway with some implementation activities when this grant opportunity came up. So we're using it to supplement a few elements of that regional plan to 2030 and then to really um, try to ramp up and demonstrate that this whole concept of regional planning has an effect with cities and towns across greater Boston, can actually improve the lives of the people who live and work there. Um, and so we're, we're trying to run as fast as we can for this three years and make some change happen and, um, and then try to figure out how to keep moving after the grant ends and goes away. Uh, I'm Summer Frederick. I'm from the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission, which is um, down in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, we are also an implementation grant. We, um, there was a, a very long public um, process that 
uh, happened years ago that created a document called the uh, Sustainability Accords, and our grant is to, um, I said earlier, I think our grant sort of falls in between implementation and planning because uh, part of our grant is to take that sustainability, that document, revisit it and bring it uh, up to date and then um, work with the County of Albemarle and the City of Charlottesville and the University of Virginia, um, who are the primary partners along with the Planning District Commission to um, implement the um, accords that are brought up to date and to um, move forward with some uh, regional planning. This is the first time that those three entities have actually sat down at the table and had conversations about long range planning. So um, that is a primary goal of ours is to keep that going and to use this grant to um, put some uh, processes in place that will hopefully carry forward into the future as well as get um, some sustainability initiatives into comprehensive plans for both the city and the county into our long range transportation plan for the Metropolitan Planning Organization and hopefully get the university to um, come on board and be a more um, uh, visible and active participant in the planning of the community. So. Great, thanks. So one of the first things I thought we might touch on is this notion of governance because even for the community challenge grants, just as a planning principle, we really want you guys to engage and involve a diverse range of communities, but it's baked into the very essence of the notice and therefore your work plans as a regional grant. So maybe you guys could say a bit uh, about the, what you've learned in the early going around building a governance structure that works um, and some of the challenges you faced. And then I'll have the GTR just say some things that kind of extrapolate from what you experienced to the broader cohort of 80, 87 grantees from uh, year one. By the way, I should mention that yesterday when uh, one of our guests got here, they looked around the room and they looked and said, orientation? A group meeting at the beginning? <laughs> Binders? What is this? So this is a group that really went to the storm really with lucky. us. And, I still uh, want a binder. <laughs> she still wants a binder and, and helped us to forge what you have in front of you today. This really is a reflection of what we learned with the grantees in year one. So. I think in some ways we're, we, are, we have an advantage because we built a, a pretty substantial constituency when we created this regional plan starting in 2003. It took us five years to build this regional plan. And it, it was a lot of relationship building and helping people understand the re relevance of these land use issues to their, um, their goals for public safety, for example. But in doing that consultation and relationship building with the people we knew, the organizations we knew were key actors in the region, we also evolved as an organization. And now public safety, for example, is a critical part of our regional plan and its goals. Um, we had a steering committee for that regional plan development process that, you know, at the end, I think we had 70 people sitting on the steering committee and maybe 40 people showed up to the meetings. They were, by and large, committed individuals who didn't particularly represent a constituency. And um, we didn't have uh, sort of the tentacles that people with constituencies would have given us into the region to help us um, gain momentum behind that plan when it was adopted. And we, we took those lessons to heart when we crafted the steering committee for this grant, where we set up a structure. Uh, we, we, we have a large consortium. It's 168 members and growing. We will never close the door to new members as long as they meet eligibility criteria that kind of exclude private interests. Uh, and they are asked to affiliate with a caucus so we have caucuses that break down by municipal community type. We have four types of municipalities out of our 101 municipalities. And we have some topical caucuses that align with our regional plan. So for example, the Healthy Communities Caucus, the Healthy Environments Caucus. And people, organizations are asked to self-affiliate with a caucus and then elect a member to the steering committee. So uh, that steering committee member is both a caucus chair and then a member of the steering committee with some responsibility for consulting and reporting back and representing that particular perspective 
on a, a 27 member steering committee body that is truly the decision making body for this grant. Um, although we managed to influence their, uh, their decisions. Uh, well, we are obviously a much smaller, not only community, but grant and um, partnership. But we have a we, we actually have a similar structure. So we have the four primary partners, which are the Planning District Commission, the University, Charlottesville, and Albemarle, and they are, they make up what we call the working group, and that's really the staff of the grant. And then um, there are a few other there are other subsidiary partners and they along with the the working group make up our advisory council and we think of that as as more of our um, sort of technical advisory uh, group they are the ones who are um, kind of experts in their field housing environment social services uh, social justice so uh, we use them as our as our technical committee and then the next group that we have is what we um, have Called, we have called our livability partnership. And that is open to any um, community organization um, in Charlottesville and Albemarle. We have a few from out outlying counties. Um, but that group is made up of representatives of those community organizations. And so those people are charged, when, when they join, they're asked to sign an agreement, a partnership agreement. Mm -hmm. And the partnership agreement charges them with being the conduit for information uh, from the grant to their community organization and then from the community organization back to the grant. We have quarterly meetings and um, the meetings started out to be two hours long and now they've grown to three hours long. But, they in, but, but it's productive and we have about 60 members. Um, typically we have 50, 55 people show up, so we have pretty good participation. Um, and the, the meetings are broken up into them reporting out, small group uh, work, and then the grant staff reporting to them what their homework is and what, what we need from them. Wow. So um, that's, that's kind of the working structure. On overseeing all of that is a group called PAC, which is a longstanding committee of representatives from the university, the city, and the county. And they have been designated as our actual decision making and approval um, group. And so we go to them when we have a product that is nearing completion or when we have something to report out, we give it to them and then they are the ones who ultimately will put the stamp of approval on the grant product as a whole. These are two regional examples, but we know that we see similar structures to some of the challenge grantees. I don't know, if Steve or Solon, if either of you want to add anything. It's just a reflection on how a challenge grantee might approach this, um, or any observations you want to share just in this issue. Steve. Well, um, most of my ch uh, challenge grants are to, uh, well, actually all of them are to, uh, well, the exception of one are to individual city governments, and well, in one case, it's a county, uh, uh, a county is grantee, but um, a couple of them have uh, governance structures that are somewhat similar to uh, uh, to a regional planning grant, although uh, uh, we don't require them to have uh, formal consortium agreements. Mm -hmm. um, but a couple of my grantees have uh, put together, uh, a, a, a formed a partnership with, with other key actors in the community, including foundations, uh, uh, educational institutions, uh, and uh, they're, they're, uh, in each case, they're working very well. Uh, uh, in other situations, the challenge grantees uh, are, are, are a city government uh, 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 or a county government, and um, certainly uh, there's a high level of public participation uh, built into their uh, initiatives, but uh, not, uh, there, there isn't the sort of government uh, governance structure mm. that, that exists in the in a, uh, in the case of the regional grantees. Mm -hmm. Good morning. 
Good morning. Uh, so there are three things that I'll bridge from yesterday's conversation. At the top of the morning, you'll remember Chris Beck from USDA making the point about democracy uh, in action. And that one of the things that is uh, both exciting, exhilarating, frustrating, uh, is that democracy is at play, I think, in lots of these uh, governance structures uh, and with lots of critiques about, uh, about these structures. So uh, that's one at least observation that I know that people heard yesterday and that you really have an opportunity to really build out. Uh, in terms of specific examples, I'll stay on the regional planning side. Uh, again, bridging from a theme yesterday, uh, there was a question about uh, sub-grantees and their presence in in consortia or where there are folks who have financial interests who necessarily might be in decision making. We do have actually one grantee, there may be some others, but one grantee that made a decision from the beginning at the point of application that all who have financial interests actually cannot have decision making authority. That anybody who has a financial interest actually should go through an RFP process to keep uh, there, was a, there was a sense in that region that financial interests and decision making would be tainted. And so they made a decision based on their local context and their read of situation that the way in which they wanted con to construct the kind of governance structure was to essentially separate out the two. Uh, there are others who, given uh, presence of local elected officials, wanted to make sure that there were various structures in play where the local electeds really had a chance to um, bring and wield their decision-making authority. But uh, when they thought about, and uh, Amy and Summer will remember the various kind of flow charting around how is it that various structures relate to others and where where there is a local elected official uh, group that has decision-making authority, that it isn't a black box, mm -hmm. that it is th the sense that as there are work groups and other structures and committees, that the work of those committees is meaningful, mm -hmm. right? That it doesn't essentially go into a, a group that's fairly closed and that, that people have a sense that the work that they do uh, will translate ultimately into some decision making and governance. And we do have some of those structures as well. The only thing I'll add at the moment so we can move to some other topics, we might come back to this, is that uh, again, this governance through action, this notion of work groups that take tasks and responsibilities both in challenge and regional grants and uh, giving some primacy to what they come up with as their findings given the right guidance and coaching from staff. Uh, helps people feel connected, engaged, know that their work is, is valuable, and many hands makes for medium work, if not light work. So I want to turn to a second about, uh, to talk about building a winning message. And uh, we've seen recently, I think, uh, on blast, uh, someone's message that didn't get well received in terms of <laughs> email communications out, out there. Um, I've gotten it about 15 times from various ones of you in the audience, uh, uh, about uh, someone who didn't like a process. It's a public process, and we recognize that these are possibilities. And so the stronger we can make our message about what we're trying to accomplish, that it is transparent, that we have these connections in place to participate, the better. Uh, I'd like, actually, uh, both Summer and, uh, and uh, Amy to talk a little bit about this. You've had different experiences on this regard, I think, both because of the momentum you had and because of some of the political dynamics in your region. I'll let you choose who goes first. <laughs> um, so. Uh, building a message, it can go, that, that topic can go pretty much anywhere. But I'll start with um, a little bit of background about our grant. We, um, in our region, we are very fortunate that long range planning and sustainability and all, everything that ever, all of us are dealing with um, are uh, widely accepted or Practice and has been and have been practiced in our community for a long time. Um, our community, the majority of, of residents in our community, know what a comprehensive plan is, know what a long range plan is, understand transportation projects. Um, so, we are very fortunate to have um, a relatively high level of uh, base knowledge with all of this going in. Um, so. While that's that's good, that's also that can also translate into um, a hurdle because there 
there's a lot of um, assumption on how processes are going to move forward. There's a lot of assumption on what topics will be covered. There is um, definitely assumption about who will be involved, who we, we will ask to be involved, who won't have to be asked but will be allowed to be involved. Um, and uh, so, so it's both sort of a blessing and a curse. Um, and with that, we started our, our process um, in a relatively comfortable space that we'd gotten the grant and we knew who partners were. We had a, an idea of where this was all going. And all of a sudden, um, there was a lot of opposition to our project and very vocal opposition. Um, pretty much came out of nowhere, and it, opposition like that had was very new in our community. So, we um, we were forced to take a step back and really create our message, and really think about what our message was and what we had to do to um, to make that message um, easy to understand and. Um, that we would stand by it. So what we did uh, was, uh, Dwayne touched on this a little bit, we um, became transparent immediately and that is sort of a non-negotiable term, what transparent means. It is everything and all information must be accessible to everyone. The way we did that is we created a website and put absolutely everything on there from working papers to our application to the um, you know, grant award letter to who was involved and how they were involved and what our structure was. And it's still not the prettiest website, but it's got a lot of information and we continue to use it sort of as a storehouse. So we did that and we um, also immediately, as staff, had to hunker down and figure out what exactly we were going to do with this grant. There wasn't the luxury of this is the direction we're going in and we're gonna kind of figure out our, our work plan and, and you know, we have time to, to move forward um, and, and you know, take, take things as they come. We had to be very sure about what our goals were, what, how we were gonna get to those goals um, and who would be, again, who would be involved in getting to those goals. Uh, and so, um, I guess long story short is that uh, in creating a message, we um, had to really sit down and be very clear as, as staff and as the partners on what we were trying to do. And when we had gotten there, then we all, had to, we all stood up and said, we are on the same page, we are moving forward um, together as a partnership and um, we understand that, as Dwayne said also, this is a public process and public processes are never easy, nor do they stick to schedules nor plans. So there is some process, you know, there is some fluidity. So, um, but uh, the, the transparency, I think, in creating a message is probably the number one thing that we learned in addressing our challenges. I think, um it's often true that crisis creates, you know, the, the need for you to step up and um, perform and just find a solution. And we, frankly, haven't had that crisis. <laughs> and, uh, and I think this is certainly an area where we have a lot to learn and a lot to progress on ourselves. In Massachusetts, there's not a particular appreciation for planning. It's not particularly required. There are no counties. Um, you know, there are... It's a different context in terms of planning, and and my organization is, uh, you know, the statutorily defined regional planning organization. But we are not the metropolitan planning organization. We're not really even endowed with transportation resources to program. So we, you know, we on the one hand um, need to act through um, persuasion and advocacy in order to implement this plan. Um, uh, and we need to do it in a way that resonates for the different constituencies that are essential to the implementation of that plan. And that means a lot of different messages 
you know, one in one meeting, a different one in another meeting, lots of different materials with lots of different frames and emphases, and we're, we're still a land use planning agency that talks like one. And so um, we have some foundation resources to help us create a communications guide to help us be less wonky. And um, you know, we're, we're having a hard time finding time to do that. It's sort of this constant struggle because we haven't had, we haven't ha you know, to put a finer point on it, we haven't had vocal opposition disrupting meetings like they have. And, <laughs> um, Let's try and do avoid <laughs> and, and, and I think that there are, th that vocal opposition is coming closer to us, and we are boning up on all of the resources that have been developed over the course of the last year, year and a half, through the hard work of folks like Summer and others to give us tools um, to sort of continue to move forward in the face of that kind of vocal opposition. Um, and I think you've got a lot of resources should that come to your <coughs> region. Um, but I think I see our greatest challenge as learning how to tell stories that are sort of illustrated with facts and that help different people understand the relevance of our work to their lives um, when we are inclined to analyze the facts and then tell people the facts. And isn't that compelling? Isn't that just so conclusive? Can't you tell? And uh, so for us, it's a, a little bit of learning how to connect with people the way we haven't yet. Thoughts from our GTR on this one? Uh, I'll mention that I think uh, that data is a very potent tool when properly used, and that's been the observation we've had. And I think actually Amy's being a little modest. MAPC's done a, an outstanding job of taking data and bringing it into different audiences in ways ranging from what they can take to a reluctant on the fringe of the region, um, you know, town manager to putting out one of the best uh, equity analyses on you know, how, what the data is from the region and having public meetings and you know, press conferences around that. And so there's some deafness there she's not tipping your hands to because she doesn't want you all to call her right away. <laughs> um, I, I think that at essence the message does have many dialects, but it's a con there's a consistency that has to be there because if you're copying inconsistent, that'll be used against you. And the DNA comes back to the livability principles and the flexibility those give you to have to align with that frame, as, as long as we're seeing you in that framework, we're, we're seeing opportunities for the message you're bringing that's going to work in your community to to work well. I think that um, this this persuasion uh, element, we see a lot of places where people are able to clearly communicate the benefit, either to a constituency or to a, a direct population or to a location, and that making sure people understand that benefit and that their time will come in this process for that benefit is really essential as well. And then uh, some of the most effective ways we've seen people deal with the vocal opposition is to engage, either uh, directly one-to-one -one or, as Summer said, being transparent and open. Um, if there is an argument of relevance there, it needs to be addressed. If there is not, it will consume itself at some point. We have some places where the fire is still burning. But it's, you know, there, there, if there is something there to be dealt with, then being ready to take that on and deal with it is essential as well. I want to talk for a minute about, uh, and I think this relates, creating achievable outcomes. You heard a lot about uh, you know, the logic model, and you heard about performance measures we'll get to in a moment. But at the end of the day, it's what kind of change are we going to see in our communities? And so I'm wondering if either of you have learned anything that you'd like to kind of throw out there about what an achievable outcome is. And I know the GTR has some things to say about that. So. I'll just offer. Um you know, kind of related to the last conversation as well as to this one. We, one of the things we've heard after six months in a year in, and one of the reasons I love coming and interacting with other grantees, uh, you know, we hear in the greater Boston region, why aren't you making more progress? Why aren't you showing more results on the ground? Where is all this money going? Why aren't you actually accomplishing change that we can see already? And um, part of it is that this is a planning grant, and part of it is that, you know, we, we've only been doing this for a year. Um, and I think that identifying those achievable outcomes is um, important uh, for us to ensure that we're using these resources to meet our ultimate goal as effectively as possible, and so that we can show how we are achieving goals that um, are, are sort of calibrated to uh, measure progress, not necessarily 
the production of 100 units. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a suite of discrete projects that come out of this grant, and for each and every one, there's a scope of work that is defined, um, that, that defines who's going to do what on what time frame and with what resources and you know, sort of tasks and outcomes and all that. And the outcomes are, we've, we've defined three levels of outcomes, and if, if we could, we would have four. The first is process benchmarks. So what will we have at the end of this discrete project? What is within our control? We will have had four public meetings. We will have engaged 50 new <coughs> constituents, oh, no, con people, <laughs> maybe representing five new constituencies. And so um, trying to document what we will do through this project. And then the next level of outcomes is the um, is the policy outcomes, we call them, but they're not necessarily policy related, but basically what's outside our control but the change we're trying to make happen through this project. So for example, our project might be to write a downtown mixed use overlay bylaw. That's the benchmark. The policy outcome is town meeting passes that bylaw. It's a, a step beyond that which we can control. Um, the third level is the regional objective, pulled directly from our regional plan. We have hundreds of objectives that are often but not always numerical and measurable, and they are the things we want to achieve by 2030. What does this project contribute to in terms of that regional objective? If we had the ability and we're working toward it, we would have a local objective in that meantime, in the space between the policy and the bylaw passing and the regional objective. We would have uh, what, what would it mean for the town of Woburn to make progress toward that regional objective? And so um, it's, it's not terribly easy to distill regional objectives to a municipal or neighborhood level, yet if we're going to help people understand the relevance of this to their lives, that's a, a level we need to be operating in. Yeah, ours are... Um Again, smaller scale, but very similar. We have um, the goals that of the project, we are going to create a performance measurement system. We are going to create um, you know, a, a common land use and transportation map. And so um, the, again, those are very specific things that products that will come out of this grant, and we have timelines for when we think, when we hope those things will be completed. Um, so there are those, and then we have um, a bit more overarching uh, goals, such as you know having the city and the county adopt various um, recommendations that we are in the process of creating into their comprehensive plans to have you know um, various bike, pedestrian, transit, road network improvement projects. Um, put into the, the MPO long range transportation plan. So we also have the project process related goals that are very clearly articulated. And then the next level for us is you know, having our partners actually implement or adopt policies or um, regulations or what, whatever is appropriate to reflect what, the, what we're trying to accomplish through our grant. Can I add something? Please. You notice neither of us mentioned logic model? Yeah. No. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Mm -mm. Um, I, I, I've come to appreciate that this office within HUD is really pushing HUD to evolve. Yes. And I am very happy to help them do that. <laughs> Um, I smell a counterinsurgency brewing right here on stage. <laughs> um, and I, I appreciate that they need to do the logic model to satisfy some of those internal requirements that they get confronted with at HUD. But um, I don't personally, nobody in my office sees the logic model as particularly useful to us. We understand that it's useful to the office at HUD. And, um, and so it's, it's something I wish we'd spend a little less time on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are some lessons that we could share. <laughs> um, but I, and I actually think we're gonna go and now create a separate logic model that's useful from our perspective to help ensure that um, we're, again, using our resources as effectively and efficiently as possible. So 
Um, I mean, let me ask to you, on share that, some of that. I on hope that, you don't that though, <laughs> is that was developing a model for your in your plan originally, or did you go to the experience and go, this one wasn't helpful, but a model would be useful? Uh, yes, <laughs> we we uh, are we uh, as staff we weren't we weren't prepared to do the logic model mm -hmm. as it was presented by HUD. Um, we did it, obviously, uh, but we uh, have we have also created another yeah. a, a model for our our project um, that just the staff created and, and used. Um, it doesn't look anything like HUD's logic model. It doesn't so it, we it was of our own creation, and it really is an internal document. Mm -hmm. um, we have. We have it, and we are happy to share it with anyone who, who wants to see it. We, it's not something we've put out to our partnership, but in the vein of we are trying to be as transparent as possible, it's there. People know it's there. They're welcome to look at it. We've had a couple people come in and want to see it, um, and so it's, it's there. It's, it's also not very pretty, but it works for us. <laughs> I want to roll into this question of how you actually start to measure your performance, but before we do that, I want to see if the GTR have anything they want to say about, they've observed about uh, creating outcomes that work for the grants in the, the 10 class. So my southern roots are going to show, and I'll start with uh, something I shared with, with grantees. Um, I think in the NOFA and in the approaches that grantees have given, uh, there is and a friend of mine from Mobile, Alabama told me this story once. Um, uh, there is a ample appreciation of the political science of the work and the rocket science of the work. Uh, and she said once that we often uh, underestimate the political science of work and overestimate the rocket science of the work. Uh, and my translation to grantees is you are working in a context and you've got to figure out your balance. And there are sets of outcomes related to both dimensions in this work. Uh, there is uh, an approach that you all said in your applications that talked about uh, will to make decisions and what does it mean to create political will to make decisions and how do you evaluate those outcomes so that they are real for you. And then there are and for all of us who are policy uh, wonks and planners, there is the rocket science of the work. And you all gave voice in your applications uh, to a set of uh, policy outcomes and toward this work being related over time to those, uh, to those uh, policy outcomes. But the reason why I situate it that way is because there is lots of flexibility, I hope, I hope, the, uh, to you giving voice to your context and giving voice to what, what makes sense for your region. Um, I know we'll, we may not have said this yet, but this relates to the previous conversation. In case anyone asks you, there is no conspiracy operating uh, in this program, okay? So you could start with that message. There's no conspiracy. This is your program for you to design on the ground with guidance, obviously, from us and a set of requirements that will help you navigate. But it really is about you understanding your own trajectory in your place um, based upon the balance that needs to be uh, struck. So that was my, and you know, there's, there's an inherent struggle mm -hmm. with what I just said. So I'm going to strike the conspiracy off my list of things we're going to talk about. Thank you, Solon. Um, uh, just one thing to add is, I'd always like to say is keep the end in mind, whatever you're doing, because you need to frame it in a way where you're not going to get that end result at the end of the day, but you want to have it where each benchmark sort of leads to that ultimate goal. So you want to always put that in mind and, and reference that whenever you're making a benchmark or a deliverable. So. So can I? Can I? Let me build off of that real quickly. Uh, that in the process gets lost. I'll just put that in it. Uh, that you will end up spending, justifiably so, a lot of time on kind of <laughs> civic in infrastructure and government. And we invite you and direct you to do it. 
Uh, but there are any number of occasions during the course of the grant period where the end escapes people mm -hmm. uh, and where many of our check-in conversations end up being, so remind me here, what, what are you trying to do? Uh, and how is this related to what you said you wanted to do? And that kind of course correction, end in sight moment uh, ends up being really helpful. Uh, the grantee from Northern Virginia would like to make a comment. <laughs> give a, a little bit more of our internal perspective on this as well. Um, so one of the things that uh, I don't know if it was mentioned yesterday or not, we were required by Congress to set up a rigorous evaluation of this program. And that is part of the onerous mm -hmm. logic model, is that while we are trying to have a framework for you all to establish what are your benchmarks, your performance metrics, the outcomes you're seeking. We need to be able to capture that in some uniform framework so that we can report back to it. Uh, and in fact, in my meeting with the appropriations staff yesterday, they asked us this question. So what do you have to show for this? And where are you at in this evaluation? And when can we expect the baseline report? And so we're in this pain together. Um, but I, I think that is part of you know, when you look at that logic model or when you're setting up these factors, uh, it's not that you have to hit on all points, it's really figuring out what makes sense for you, but I think to Tad's point as well, set up outcomes that you think are achievable, sort of, you know, what is within your control, and yes, you'll have some, some stretch, stretch marks, I call them, um, <laughs> of, you know, you're setting up a plan that you want this plan to help reduce VMT, perhaps, or you want the plan to help uh, achieve equity outcomes and other things like that, but also don't set it up so there's really nothing you control within a three-year time period that in any way is going to be touching on, because we, we've seen some of that from last year's folks where, you know, that's a great goal but really nothing that you're doing may directly be having an impact on the school lunch program. I mean, it might be, and if it is, that's you know, good and you're welcome to measure that, but it might not be the case. But I just want to put a little bit of a finer point. Uh, so we do have a contractor who's working with us on the evaluation work, and part of that also includes um, the capacity for them to do technical assistance for up to 30 communities specifically on performance measure and evaluation. Uh, and so that is something also you'll be hearing more about in addition to the capacity building team. So <laughs> policy guidance 2012-04. Here forward, the term logic model will only be used after adjectives such as glamorous, wondrous, resplendent. Onerous will not be used in front of the logic model. <laughs> I just thought I'd try it. Never mind. You can use whatever adjectives you want, um, and that won't show up in policy guidance. Um, so we're going to cover one more, uh, you should hear the terms we use about the model in, in the office when we're looking at 28 of them at once. Anyway, um, I would go one more topic and I, we brought Josh back, I mean, performance measurement is obviously something he's leading for us, but also just I'm going to go to the GTR first here and this is what's helpful for you as a GTR in engaging and working with the grantees mm -hmm. and if you want to throw something that's a little vexing, you can put that out there too. And then uh, the grantees will have a chance to respond on things that they notice as well. This won't turn into a Jerry Springer episode, but uh, <laughs> I think some of that dynamic is really essential as we try to build partnerships. And then we're gonna open the floor up for questions. We have about a half an hour to dialogue openly with, uh, with the audience. And any questions you wanna ask, particularly the grantees, because you'll have time with the GTR this afternoon. So, uh, Steve. Steve, if you like to. Steve, uh, just for context, in FY10, Steve has uh, the Region 5 grantees, in fact, we call him the Zara 5 because mm -hmm. he has all 17 grantees that are in that HUD region. Much like a Zara, he's expanding his territory in FY11 to include some of Region 7 <laughs> and 3, but uh, he can reflect on working with Region 5 a little bit. Um, right, and, and actually, uh, this year I have all the new grantees in Region 5 as well, so uh, uh, I'm continuing my, my czarship there. Uh, it, it also happens to be my, my home region, so I, I feel comfortable there, I guess. But, um, you know, my approach is pretty straightforward. Uh, early on in, in, the, in the grant, pro, or it, it, like right around now, uh, next month or so, um, I'll be talking to my uh, grantees about their, their work plans, 
uh, the, uh, obviously the regional grantees about their consortium agreements. And uh, we've, we've gone ov over all the basics uh, in, in this, uh, over the past day or so. And um, really going forward after that, it's really just a matter of, um, uh, of, of uh, implementing the work plan. Uh, and uh, I, um, obviously there, there are always issues that arise, problems uh, that need to be addressed. And uh, uh, you know, we, we work through those, but um, it, it's a pretty kind of uh, uh, simple, simple approach to things. When you're juggling as many grants as I am, um, uh, that's really uh, the only approach I, I could take. Um, you, I don't know if I have anything really more to add. I mean, I'd like to hear, you know, from the grantees, uh, you know, what, what their issues are with, uh, it, it, with the, you know, as to the relationship with HUD, and, um, you know, and uh, obviously uh, we, we could uh, uh, have a conversation about that before they lay into us. <laughs> um, um, so. Uh, I'll use the check-in calls, these ones that you've heard about, as kind of an example. Um, they can be uh, short, they can be long. Uh, my own kind of rule with the grantees is um, uh, perhaps because of the mutual distaste that uh, they and, and sometimes I have for the administrative stuff, uh, we essentially have kind of 10 to 15 minutes uh, for all of the kind of technical questions they have, lots of requests, logic model complaints, all of those <laughs> things that we end up doing. And then for the balance of the time, which is often either half to three quarters of the time, I say, I want to talk about the work. I want to talk about how it's moving. Uh, uh, and there are, to Maria's point, there are often times in those conversations where a points about progress that seem incremental for the grantee um, uh, get lifted out immediately in those calls. And I say, that sounds, you underemphasize that, but that sounds like that's a huge moment for you. And we might spend five minutes on the call just framing out the story. Mm -hmm. What's happening? Who's in it? What's, and so we use often those calls, and often I make requests to them to say, I would love for you to frame out that five minutes. Uh, in a way that's authentic for your region, but really represents a moment in your, in your kind of story of progress. Uh, and so I often, in terms of the check-in calls and the, and the points, really kind of say, you know, I'm here to help you, and I'm also here to tell your story, and while it seems incremental, it may be huge for you, so those are the kind of moments that I think can be uh, can be really helpful, and sometimes they are often very hidden to the grantees and take kind of focus. Uh, so I just, I just want to give a, a plus one to uh, what Solon just said. That's that's like ditto in Google speak. So, um, so um, but just to kind of elaborate on that further, it's really hard for us to understand what are the the most important pressing things for each of our individual grantees at any moment. And we love to be uh, reminded of that, actually. Um, we, we're, we're always looking to like find, like there's a lot of, like, like we're, we've been talking about for the past day and a half, there's a lot of process stuff that we need to get through. But there's a lot of um, content stuff that we really want to talk about. And since you guys are the ones who are actually doing the work, you have a much better idea of what are the, the key points, what are the key lessons from things that you've done, what are the upcoming events that, are re that you really think are, are crucial. And we really, please highlight that for us because you know, as, as is clear, we have a lot of grants, uh, we each have a lot of grants on our, our plate. And um, it's so helpful for you, for you guys to, to kind of give us, give us points of emphasis and kind of uh, context. Um, the other thing is that um, as far as reimbursements go, so, um, <laughs> what do you guys think I'm gonna say? We, we talked about um, that yesterday, just. <laughs> oh, oh, that hasn't happened yet? No, we did, but, oh, okay, sense, right. but you can pile on. Okay, so, um, there, first of all, I, I don't know what, what the agreement among the GTRs for this new cohort is, but um, 
I think it's really important to, to get a, a very, a very um, a detailed sense of what documentation your GTR is looking for from you for each, for, for, for each drawdown, for each type of expense. Um, because we've received a, a wide variety of different types of documentation, um, ranging from, you know, here's like a one page description of what we did, and you know, there you go, from, to a literally like 200 page dossier, uh, like, like listing out like every single employee's like, like number of hours per pay period on this project, and you know, everything the contractors have done. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that we all approach it slightly differently, so it's important to, to know to, to ask your GTR if um, if they don't if they don't initially tell you what it is that they're looking for exactly. Um, also, if you're if there's like del the other thing that, that just is kind of seems kind of inconsequential, but isn't is that if if you're submitting documentation for a drawdown or some other process and it ends up being like, like you submit the first thing and then you don't submit the second thing till like a week or two later or whatever. Don't just be like on the second email, okay, this goes along with that other thing, thanks. Like, <laughs> ex explain, resubmit the other thing, because you, it, it's, I'm sure it's, it's buried under 500 other emails and I'm not exaggerating. Like, to just be, the clearer that you can make these documentation submissions, the easier it is for everybody. Yeah, the phrase we used yesterday was clear in, quick out. Uh, I want to share a few thoughts, and as some of you have heard, I have a few grantees myself. Um, I start with the context. Uh, you know, we just got back from the Gulf Coast. We visited three grantees, uh, an 11 grantee and two 10 grantees. And we understood the 10 grantees before we went, but nothing like we do now. You just can't understand until you're there. And so in the absence of us getting to you, and we're working to get to everyone, you have to give us that context, or we won't be able to effectively be your GTR. That's why we're bringing sustainability officers and field staff to the table to be more partners with us. That's why we really rely on that, that back and forth and that dialogue. You have to be honest. We don't want a report from you saying, oh, this is just going so great. Um, <laughs> we are 100% on task and schedule and drawdown requirement. This is awesome. And then. Five months later, you're like, oh my God, Wayne, what do we do about, you know, this is, that doesn't help us. We need the disclosure and the evolution along the way because if we know sooner, we can act faster and probably be more effective. We need clarity about what you need from us and what you're trying to do so that we can be effective in just that analysis and back and forth. Uh, we need notice. Uh, it is great to get an, an email with an exclamation point saying, we want to get this RFP out by Monday at Friday evening at two. I won't call you out by name, but you're in this room. Um, and you know, we'll try to make those responses, but you know, we, it's, we, you may feel like we're one to one with you, but we're actually many to one, as Barbara said. And so the more notice you can give us, the better. And then those times when you really can affect or avoid it, we're willing, it's easier to step up because you know, it's not like, oh, it's the exclamation point lady again. You know, there's none of you gotten that label at this point, but just know that you know, the more you can be helpful with us, the more you can be helpful with you. I think flexibility, it cuts both ways. I will be the first to admit, I've been a little late on a few things, getting out there, getting back to people. And I don't mind being called out on it. If you call me back and say, hey, where is this? I will jump on that. But we need that flexibility and back and forth. And Amy's smiling because I got to surrogate her grant when Amit was on rotation. <laughs> and we had some of those conversations. They're moving fast clip. Um, high performers, I've, I've learned that we have to dig underneath that. So we have some regions uh, and they, they just they could go for 45 minutes, but all the good stuff that's happening, and it'd be legitimate. But I always ask the question, what's the first thing you wake up thinking about that you're not feeling comfortable with? Because that's how we go from being a solid performer to being an exceptional performer, really reaching the aspiration. Uh, and then I think the, the stretch both ways. We have to push ourselves in the office, and I think you'll observe we do, because this is a very small window we have. We're not exactly sure how small it is, but we're going to act as if it's incredibly small until we know otherwise. And it's a small window you have in this moment to make these programs and plans work. And so I think we have to inspire each other about that and stretch in both directions. So with that, I want to stop and turn to the audience. I'm sure you guys have questions either for the GTR. Oh, but did you guys want to pile on us as well? I almost got away with that. It, it's not all bad. <laughs> no, I, I would say that um, the number one thing for 
me to remember is that it is a relationship and it is a working relationship and you're not going to know this person even though you've met your GTR presumably um, you're not really going to know the person on the other end of the phone and there is some getting to know each other and and recognizing that and um, as Dwayne mentioned all of it cuts both ways you know they need to know what you need from them, but you know you also need to know what they need from you. So it, it has to be a conversation, and you have to, um, you know, so, sometimes you have to get used to something that may be outside your comfort zone. You, for instance, you may have to get used to if you don't hear back from your GTR, then it's just assumed that it's okay. I don't, I don't always work so well with that, but I've gotten better with it, you know. Um, but because it is fast-paced, and there are a lot of technical um, questions and, and overarching questions and issues that come up, and I certainly am one that have lots of fires, that there are lots of explosions that happen with our project. And, you know, it's, it's getting to know your GTR and getting to know what questions to ask immediately, like what questions need to be answered right now? When do I need to pick up the phone? When do I need to send a, an email? And which questions can I wait until the check-in? Um, and, and so it's, it's, not gonna be, it's not gonna be easy right away and it's not gonna be a give and take right away, but it, it, get, it gets to that flexibility on both sides, so. I think when we, um, when we applied for this grant, we knew it was a cooperative agreement, but we kind of ignored what that may have meant. <laughs> and then we got the grant, and it was a grant, and that must have been just like any other grant, except it's not. <laughs> and, um, and at first, we were sort of like, what the heck is this partnership they want? And at least in the early days, it felt a little bit more like they wanted to just look over our shoulder and approve everything and we weren't really sure what they were adding to it. And I've gained a, an appreciation um, through trial and error, and some, well, trial and success more than yeah. trial and error, um, that these are my partners. And I've gotten to know people beyond my GTR, but my GTR, you know, um, who, the woman who does our grant management calls like a, a freshly baked loaf of bread. He's just so wholesome. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we'll be sure to like, tell him that. <laughs> I did notice he wasn't here, um, but uh, you know, it's just he's always got these insightful questions. He's only part-time GTR; the rest is this topical emphasis. Yet he's always thoroughly read our documents, and sometimes he's pushing us, sometimes we're pushing him. There's always a thoughtful conversation that happens, and always a, a, a respectful give and take that makes us the decision maker, but he's the advisor. And um, I've come to really value that in a way that people don't, who, people in my office who don't have that regular contact uh, are somewhat taken aback sometimes by the level of honesty and, and sort of being very frank with him that I'm willing to be. And, and I get cautioned, oh, you don't necessarily want to sh share that with HUD. And I, you know, frankly, I do because I want his opinion about how to handle something. And so. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some internal politicking there as well. <laughs> we, uh, we, we refer to uh, her GTR, you met him yesterday, Amit Serene, as the question, because he is very insightful in how he asks his questions, so it's a perfect pairing with, uh, with the <laughs> APC. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, if you have other um, flavorful metaphor nicknames for us, please pass them on. Those can go into our performance evaluations, <laughs> and it can be really quite no. useful. Yeah. I don't know if we have any questions from the audience that uh, folks want to ask either of the grantees or the GTR. This is your first chance with the GTR. We'll, we'll close out with an hour and a half or an hour, I forget which, where you'll be able to really drill in with your GTR specifically, but this is a chance for a quick shot. A question for the um, grantees. How much of your governance and process evolved in the course of the last year and how much of it was exactly the way you predicted it would be when you That's made your question. application? That's a good question. Um, much of it is structurally as we designed it in the application, but it's not operating the way we thought it would necessarily. Um, you know, we, we, we had an interim steering committee. We named the organizations in our application. They helped us get up and running until we could have an election to seat the permanent steering committee in the course of discussing all of that. They changed the term from three years to 18 months. 
And so those are sort of the structural changes we made. But um, there's a very, very interesting dynamic within the steering committee between the municipal members and the nonprofit members. Very interesting dynamic. And, and between the suburban and the urban ur organizations. And so we, we um, as a staff, gave up a fair bit of control, and um, we, we don't have control now, <laughs> even though we managed to exert some influence. And, um, and so that's, that's taking the grant in a slightly different direction than we might have imagined, although we cite HUD all the time as not allowing us to do X, <laughs> Y, or Z, and, and um, they may or may not know that they're not allowing us to do X, Y, or Z. Um, <laughs> So, and we're totally comfortable with that role, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah. Got it. laughs> no, like we're, we're totally comfortable as being painted as like the bad guy. Yeah, like, it's useful. Yeah, it's very useful at times. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. So long as it's accurate. <laughs> of course, and so I think um, we are. We we first created these caucuses, and we were hoping they would come call them sort of an affinity group and appreciate their common interests and come up with an agenda to work on together with minimal staff time. N no, it's not <laughs> happening. You know, one of the caucuses has really taken off. It's our Fair Housing Caucus, and they want to give the rest of the steering committee a training in fair housing because they're convinced that nobody else gets it. And I'm partially right. And, and so they've, they've got sort of, they're driven by that goal, but none of the other caucuses are really motivated with their own agenda. They, they were asked to comment on an RFP process that we went through, and then they were upset that we didn't follow their direction, and they were, you know, participating. And so we've learned that we need to, um, you know, ask for the kind of involvement that will be useful to us and not just create an involvement opportunity that they mm -hmm. can fill, because they'll fill it and they'll have expectations of us following their their guidance when it's not typically practical for that to happen. Um, so I, I, I hope I'm answering your question. It's mm -hmm. structurally largely the same, but functionally it's a lot more dynamic than we'd ever expected. Yeah, for us, um, the partnership group that I talked about, um, that was not part of our application. That actually came out of, um, so that was, that, that was part, that is part of our structure that evolved very, very quickly. That was part of, how we chose to address the vocal op one way we chose to address the vocal opposition and open it up and use the community for to help us get information out um, the structure that was in the grant is still there um, and i would echo it it functions a little differently than i think uh, was anticipated going into the project um, the other it's it's not really I don't know if it's so structure, but structural, but the way staff functions and what we spend our time on, that has certainly evolved from where we started. Um, and some of it is we had expectations on what kind of involvement we would have from our advisory council, from our working group, from the partnership, and that those expectations have been met on some levels, but not on others, and we've had to become a lot more involved with mm -hmm. those groups than we had originally anticipated. We've had to um, do a lot more management of um, our actual partnership, and there's a lot more administration of the project as a whole than I think we had originally anticipated. You're going to spend way more time on management and administration than you expect right now. In my experience, yeah, <laughs> you're going to want to address that, aren't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, uh, I'm actually. Uh, one thing that's striking me is that both of these are regional planning grantees, and yeah. we got a fair number of community challenge grantees. And so, for those who are community challenge grantees who are thinking, I have no idea what any of this means, <laughs> uh, because this is not quite in my structure or how I'm thinking about it. You heard Dwayne mention earlier our absolute essential requirement toward engagement. Uh, regardless of scale, right? You might be thinking about a neighborhood or a subsegment of a corridor or whatever it is, how we think about kind of engagement. So I hope with your GTR later that you either go through the kind of translations of the various lessons, mm -hmm. particularly from regional planning. But, Dwayne, one quick point for a community challenge grantee that gets maybe to even <laughs> an earlier question. Um, I would really encourage for all grantees, but to, particularly for some of our community challenge grantees who represent cities and who represent a department within a city, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, 
to do the silo busting that we would encourage you to do. And I'll give you an example. We have one community challenge, this probably happens for any number of you, one community challenge grantee who gave voice uh, to an employment lands set of findings of another department during a check-in and just kind of mentioned it. But it wasn't at all related to work they were doing in their department. And in a typical Amit Serene kind of question moment, I said, do you guys actually know about that, about that survey? Because it would strike me that an employment land survey actually has some bearing on how you want to think about housing, transportation, and jobs. Mm -hmm. It didn't at all strike the community challenge grantee because it was a different department. And I would encourage you, again, we will always incentivize the connection. So you struck them with it. and they. I, so I struck them with it. I said, it might be a useful thing to actually figure out what that employment land survey that your private sector community, your chamber of commerce, and all these elected officials are really taking a look at. It might be useful for you to actually go and take a look at what that is and see whether there's some natural connection points. But again, you will always hear, I think, from us Make the connection. Are there ways we can help you? And particularly, given, it's, given our desire to be integrated and comprehensive, regardless of whether you're a community challenge grantee or a regional planning grantee, to, to do that. So I just wanted to make that. Good morning. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one, I guess, is generally to the, to the panel. Um, and the second is more focused on the, uh, the grantees. Um, First of all, I, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, um, the regional planning agency there, and uh, we are just embarking on this whole concept of thinking um, at, at a scale, really, that we've never thought of before, um, the full eight-county MSA. So um, as we are kind of looking at our process design um, and grappling with our outcomes, and we grappled with this even at, um, during the application, you know, can we really specify goals at this time? I and mean, we can kind of vaguely characterize the basic outcomes um, based on what we sort of generally know um, in the planning world. But um, while I think everyone in our region has a vague understanding that we're kind of at an inflection point in our growth as a region, that means very different things to different people. And I'm a little worried about, even in the, the logic model, specifying quantitative targets um, at a moment where people are still kind of a little bit uncertain um, about this overall process and, and whatnot. So I guess that if you could comment on how to manage um, your presentation of, of goals and outcomes and logic model. And then the, the second question, more specifically focused uh, to the grantees, is how do you handle kind of the spatial distribution of goals and outcomes? And one thing that really interested me that Amy sp uh, spoke about was sort of this regional objectives and that's sort of how you distill what the concepts you know, that you engage with in the planning process mean for individual communities. Because obviously, a 10% you know, reduction in VMT isn't gonna be possible in some of our rural communities that are dependent on long haul transportation into the urban core. And I'll take the, uh, the first question. And by the way, he meant the glamorous, wondrous, resplendent <laughs> logic model per uh, 2012-04, uh, the new guidance. Um, so the logic model is a learning tool. I should get you guys to say it with me. The logic model is a learning tool. <laughs> if you have 42 outcomes that you're measuring in your project, if we didn't come along, if you're making your own logic model and you say we have 42 outcomes, you can look at those 42 outcomes and say, you know what, these eight or 10 are core to our project. And you can look at the logic model and say, these six fit in here somewhere and we're going to use two other fields. And that's what you put in the logic model. Do not make the logic model more difficult than it has to be. It's difficult enough as it is. That said, I understand the context you're talking about where you're not sure of those measures. So in the model itself, you might pick some process orientations and again, some of the potential change in projection that you might anticipate that you're comfortable saying, we know as a community this is a goal we want to reach. And again, the impact of your plan on affecting that change in projection is a measurable thing as far as we're concerned. So that's how I deal with the model itself. But then there's a bigger question of how you start to talk about building a common understanding of your goals. And you can actually work with your GTR to set some meta-level benchmarks for progress or at the point at which you'll be able to identify those longer-term goals. That's part of that negotiation process in the work plan. 
Now I'll turn to the grantees for the other piece. Um, I, I would I would actually just echo what you said. I think that there are there are ways in which you can maybe establish uh, numerical or not uh, a sense of what it will mean to succeed in the active. You know, what do you hope to accomplish first? It's probably something about participation. How many different organizations do you want to bring into your process? What is the diversity of the organizations with which you're consulting? How are they learning about each other? Are they, are they starting to appreciate, I don't, know, I don't know how the heck you'd measure this, but one of the great successes that we cite is one of the report outs from a table conversation in a meeting we had in 2005 or 2006 where the, the somebody from somebody's friend came to this meeting and, and his report out was, well, we wanted to preserve all of this open space, but we also wanted to make housing more affordable for people who live and work in Boston. And we realized that we couldn't do both of those things, and so we came to a compromise around the table. And so the, that report out revealed to us that people were starting to understand the trade-offs that are inherent in this kind of planning work. And you know that's probably the kind of success you'd be looking for in those early stages about helping people gain an understanding and appreciation for each other's perspectives and through, through broader participation. One more question? No. Did you want to oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Morning. I'm Ben Frost from New Hampshire Housing. Um, I, I really appreciate that HUD is, is willing to uh, be the bad guy and wear the black hat, but I think it's important for everyone here to recognize that what we say about HUD has, has meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we badmouth the, the program for all the, and I, I work for an agency that works with HUD an awful lot, you know, home and Section 8, and so sometimes criticisms are justified. But what we say uh, yeah. it, it forms the basis of a story that people have and, and carry with them. Um, and, and so I guess my, my question to the, the grantees would be, um, you know, recognizing data are really important but they're meaningless outside of some sort of story-based context. Exactly. Uh, how are you using stories, whether it's case studies or, or stories about individuals who are benefited by what you're doing, to tell your story? Go ahead. Uh, I started last time. OK. Uh, so one of the other things that, that we learned early with all of our vocal opposition is that um, the only way we were going to have a productive project was if we localized the the grant if we told those stories about not not necessarily individuals or even um, specific community groups just how did how does the work that we are proposing to do through this project affect someone's daily life um, and we, you know, we're working with comprehensive plans, long-range transportation plans, you know, 30 years in the future, projects that, you know, people who live in the community now may never see come to fruition because they will have moved on. Um, and so in the beginning, the stories we told and are still telling are very, um, more along the lines of explanatory. So this is what a comprehensive plan is. You may think it is this nebulous document that really doesn't affect what you do every day or your life or your house, property, um, but it does and this is how it does. It is a policy document that elected and appointed officials use as their guiding document. So the goals that we put in that that we're talking about right now through our process and that will be adopted at some point are going to affect whether or not you can subdivide your property or whether or not you can, you know, whether or not a road will go through your backyard. And so it, it really, the stories weren't necessarily specific about someone who I can name, but mm -hmm. it's how what I am doing might affect you on an everyday level. 
and it's finding that connection, that localization of your work that for us has been extremely important and extremely successful. It's, it's not only allowed people to put what we do in a context that they can understand and that they can live with every day, but it's also taken our project out of the national, well, t hasn't totally taken our project out of the national craziness uh, or you know, up upheaval, but it, it's, it's allowed us to create more, um, more connections on our local level with our critics. So we can go to our critics and say, this is why we're doing this, and this is why we think it's important. A lot of those critics still think that what we're doing is not valid, but it, it allows us to have a much more personal conversation about it. Can I try to address this in a way that also tries to address the second question that we failed to address yeah. a moment ago? Um, we have a 101 municipalities, no county government, and each is you know, fiercely independent and convinced that they are absolutely unique. Um, we created a policy plan with a conceptual land use map that identifies in broad strokes where there are conditions that make us suggest <coughs> urbanization greater growth and development makes sense, where there are conditions that make, suggest that um, preservation of historic and recreational or open space makes sense. Uh, I've actually had local planners call me up and say they can't zoom in far enough on the map to see what we would have them do in their town, and that's good <laughs> because um, you know, we, we are working at the regional level and with a good understanding of our 101 municipalities and the neighborhoods in each, but completely insufficient to suggest what they might do, and we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot politically to um, go to them and say, you should do X. So it's, um, it sets the stage for us to provide a regional context and to ask questions about their decision making at the local or neighborhood level. To, and at this point, we try to, um, you know, a lot of this grant is creating pilot projects that engage um, a willing community in, in, in going through their own process to identify, for example, priority development areas, priority preservation areas, priority transportation investment corridors. We're there to support their decision making and we increasingly are clear that we have the regional agenda in mind as we do so, but it's their decision making process. And um, places that are willing often have uh, somebody who's been working with us uh, for years, who is willing to take uh, a, a more or less formal leadership role, often an informal leadership role, where they're helping their local colleagues uh, understand that MAPC is not there to try to strong arm them. Remember, we have absolutely no power, so we can't. And, um, and that, that local champion is the one who tells the stories about how our work had an impact somewhere else and now we need to do this for Hamilton. And um, there's a lot of power in the local voice telling that story. So we don't, we don't and we, I mentioned earlier, we're, we're wonks, right? So we, don't, we aren't particularly good at telling local stories with an authentic voice. It's a heck of a lot more authentic if they're telling the story, and then we can cite them, we can quote them, mm -hmm. but having a, a, somebody with that, that authentic local perspective is, I think, much more powerful. Then, in, in closing also to your question, I think uh, we take your point. We do play the heavy at moments in your communities and regions, but usually that's been a result of a conversation with your GTR. We're having this situation. What is your opinion take on this? And the moment comes, it's a mutual decision. Um, <laughs> but in terms of the narrative you're talking about, I do think there's some things, and hopefully this orientation is giving you a taste of this that you'll get a full drink of over the months to come. It's about customer service and responsiveness. It's about partnership. It's about commitment. It's about innovation. And it's about impact. And that's what we're trying to do as an office. That's what you should be taking back to your partners and consortiums is your biggest takeaways from this conversation. And that's really the, the HUD story we want to tell as you're working with us on these grants. So if you'll join in thanking our uh, guests from grantees, old grantees.
We're not going to stop this conversation here. We are going to stop for a break, though. And uh, you'll notice some guys running cable. There's a town hall meeting uh, that's happening. And so the recorded portion and archive of the uh, training will cease here. Those of you who didn't come, we told you to be here. But we uh, are going to keep going. After the break, we're going to actually have um, some small group discussion on each of the topics we were just talking about. Effective government, building a winning, building a winning message building partnerships, et cetera. They'll be spread across the tables when you get back from your break. Let's try to be back by, let's say, 10, 15. And then we'll go into that section, which will roll us toward lunch. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs>